shall we worship the Lord and we'll exalt his name together. And praise God, you know, all kinds of things happen when you get in one accord. That's right. Amen? That's right. So, look at what happened on the day of Pentecost. Look at what happened when Peter and John were released from jail and they went back to their own company and they formed a prayer and a prayer meeting and you know what? The place was shaken. They asked the Lord to stretch forth their arm to heal by your holy child, Jesus. And if you need healing today, boy, you came to the right place. Can you say amen? amen. amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day and this morning and your people, God. I pray, Lord, that you would come into this service, that you would bless each and every one of us, that we know that we've been in the presence of God today. And Lord, we just want to give you glory, honor, praise, that you would be magnified in this place, God, and exalted. In Jesus' name, amen. We waited for this day. We gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire to burn our hearts with you. You're the reason we're here.
in your behalf. So I pray, Father, that you would open up our eyes right now. Open the eyes of our hearts to see you high and lifted up because you're worthy of praise, worthy of worship, worthy of our breath and our lives. Lord, you're worthy of everything. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord. See Shining in the light of your glory. Lord, pour out your power and love as we sing. Oh! 
show me your glory. Then God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. Only you, Jesus. Only you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, God. I worship you. You are the way. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are the way maker, Jesus. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are.
pray and then we're going to sing this and you're going to declare that miracle that you need is he is able and he is doing it. And so today, if you need a miracle, would you just raise your hand? You just need a miracle. Okay, look around you and see somebody with their hand raised and just put your hand on their shoulder. Some people need some miracles today. How many believe that we're going to see some miracles? I see a lot of miracles already. Father, thank you. Thank you that you're the miracle worker. Thank you that you're the one that restores and renews. Thank you that you're the one that says to captives, I'm setting you free. Thank you that you're restoring and healing minds. Thank you that you're healing and restoring marriages, Lord. Thank you that God, you are God making a way in the places where it seems impossible, that you are the God that heals, you're the God that provides, you're the God that moves in mighty ways. And miracles are today because there's your kingdoms today. And so we say, pour out more, more provision, God. Meet needs, supernatural, supernatural. We thank you, Jesus. And we bless your name, oh God. We trust you today, God, peace right now. Fill minds with peace, Lord. Open up doors that seem to be shut, God. Provide everything that we have need of because we are a member of the kingdom of God. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. And so we say, yes, Lord. For those that are streaming with us right now, we say, God, move, move, move. You know every person today, and you know the miracle they need. And so we say right now, let God the impossible become possible because you are the God of the impossible. And so we say, yes, today, God. Give gifts of faith, God, where people believe your word, where they believe your promises. God, I can't pray against right now where there's people in shadows. God, let them come to the light because you are the God of the light. We say yes right now. No no fear. Perfect love. Drive back all fear right now. Let people be a, a feel and a sense of assurance right now. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Father. We bless you when we declare that. You said if two or three would come in agreement, you're going to do it. So we say yes. How many agree with that? Say yes. amen. 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 He's even the way maker for you and yes. I. Yes. 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 He's the miracle worker. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. He's the promise keeper.
and a time where we can just, we did that Friday here, um, in Friday morning here, it was just powerful. Um, come up to the barn and just spend an evening just enjoying the presence of God. Right. Right. Enjoying worship and prayer. Right. And, and sometimes, um, uh, Bob told me something a week ago that really stuck with me when we were in our men's group. If you're a man and you have Wednesday mornings free, come at 7 o'clock, you will be blessed by it. Um, but he said something to me. He said, you know what? I used to never want to go up to the prison in Maranesco. But he said, my flesh didn't want to go. But he said, you know what? I committed to do it. And when I went, when I left there, I was so blessed and so happy I did it. Some of our flesh will come in the way of worship and prayer because the enemy wants to keep you from worship and prayer. But when you will push back past your flesh, past your feelings, what you will leave that barn with is an experience with the presence of God that will fill you with a sense of peace, a sense of strength and joy. Isn't that true? Yeah. Am I saying what is true or not? Yes. Yes. Amen. So let's do what God's called us to do and let's make that a place. I met with two couples out there yesterday that are looking for their weddings. Next, next year we already have six weddings already that are contracted and we have two couples yesterday that wanted to meet with me and we have more that are coming. And so praise God, huh? Yeah. Praise God that we're seeing the fulfillment. And here's what I said to each one of those couples. Something that Denise said when we first went out there to pray is she said, every couple in this place that will get married, we're going to pray that they never go to a divorce lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what, when I shared that with those couples yesterday, they were so energized by that. They were so encouraged by that. One of them had their mom with them. And I can tell you when I said that, because I said, here's what happens firsthand. I see the pain of divorce. And I tell you what, it resonated with her. Her eyes betrayed the pain in her heart because people know the pain that comes. And so we need to continue to pray. And I said, we're going to have a place where people are blessed, where they don't have to go into $20,000 in debt to do a wedding at a wonderful place. And they're going to be blessed and they're going to be encouraged and they're going to know the presence of God and the peace of God. Can you say amen to that? Yes. Yes. That's exactly what I told them. And they walked away from me. I said, could I pray with you? Hear me. The reason why we don't pray with people is because we don't ask them. But if we will ask them, they will let us pray with them. Yes. Because people long to be encouraged. They long to be strengthened. So come and be a part of that. Um, this morning, we're going to watch a video. We're starting our Wednesday nights. Uh, if you want to help out with our Wednesday night kids ministry, it's starting uh, the day after uh, Wednesday after Labor Day. So I just want to let you know that. Um, we're going to watch a video this morning. Here's what happens in our society is we elevate the problems. Problems are easy to point out, aren't they? All of us can be experts at pointing out problems. And those seem to be the ones that get all the press, don't they? The good news somehow gets hidden back on page 11, if it even gets in there. But we need to be people that continue to look at the great in this nation. We need to continue to be looking at the good in this country. Um, have you heard that word systemic lately? How many are just getting sick of the word systemic? I just hear it over and over. Systemic, I looked it up, and systemic means this. Systemic means an overall condition of something. So it can neither, it neither defines something that's positive or negative. It just defines as the overall condition or structure of an organization. But what we hear continually is that we have a systemic problem of racism in this nation. That means the overall structure, the, continue, the complete condition of the nation is one of racism. How many know that that is not true? That is not true. That is not true. We do not live in a racist nation. We love one another because we are called. Now, do we have those problems? Certainly we do. But are they on the whole? Not at all. A couple of weeks ago, I was driving to uh, get a coffee, and I was thinking of this word systemic. And then I began to look it up and figure out what it meant. And I posted a video, and a guy said to me yesterday, he said, God never comes to church. He says to me, I've been watching your videos. When are you going to post another one? Because I agree with everything you're saying. Amen. <laughs> he said to me, because I, I, I posted a video on it, because here's what I found. Systemic means an overall condition. So I'm driving to 
get a coffee, I see a lady that lives in an apartment on the second floor in Wakefield. And I see her out putting her garbage out. And I know this lady because I've prayed for her and she's taking care of her wonderful husband of many years who now has been stricken by Alzheimer's. And I see her do it just continually over and over. And there she is, six o'clock in the morning, putting her garbage on the curb. And you know what I think to myself? Systemic compassion. Mm -hmm. An overall condition of compassion and loyalty. Mm -hmm. Then I walk in there and a guy gives me, he says, let me buy you coffee today, Pastor. I said, great. Systemic kindness, it's everywhere around us. Yes. And then I walk out and I see a guy getting in a semi from Wausau. He delivers building supplies up here. And I know, because I do the math, that he's had to be up by 4 o'clock and he's buying a sandwich from the warmer there in Holiday. And I know that that's systemic hard work. But hear me, we live in a world right now that none of those things get elevated. Right. Those, is, those are not on the news channel. They just go about their jobs. They just go about their days. They just do what they're called to do. This place is fulfilled, filled with systemic faith. Right. It's the overall condition of your life. Yes. It's what surrounds you. It's what builds you up. It's what encourages you. And you know what? No one will come and put the spotlight on you and say, man, look at that guy. He's up early. He stays up late. Look at that lady. She has been faithful. She's been compassionate. It doesn't matter what her past has been. It doesn't matter how many people have treated her wrong. She's going to treat one another, each other with kindness because that's who she is. See, those are the things that what we need to do as a community is we need to begin to elevate those wonderful things. Amen. Those systemic wonderful things in our lives that are woven through us. Right. That are the complete fabric of who we are. And we need to begin to, to elevate those things in this nation right now. Because we're, as you know, in a battle. And so we're going to focus on whatever's true, whatever's good, whatever's lovely, whatever's a good report. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 We want to welcome you today. If you're with us today, we're blessed to have you. And uh, we're believing this. We're believing that God's going to fill this place again with people that are hungry for him. Right. And so let's continue to pray for this country. Let's continue to pray for this nation. Invite somebody to come with you to the barn on Friday night and enjoy just some great worship together. You guys are gonna come and uh, receive our offering this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, we are blessed to have you and live stream with us. If you live stream with us and, and you want to give, we encourage you to do that because that's part of who God called us to be is we're faithful with what God's entrusted to us. And uh, amen. How many enjoyed Nick Backman last Sunday at the barn? Yeah. Well, Nick's had an eventful week. <laughs> yes. Last, uh, I'll just quickly share. Um, so we went to college here at Gogibic, and he said he felt such a weight when he was there Monday, and he knew God gave him a dream Tuesday morning, and God showed him that that's not what he was supposed to be doing. He was supposed to go back to Bible college. And so Nick has heard from the Lord that, isn't it good that God just gives you such divine direction? Yeah. Yeah. And so, amen. And uh, uh, so we're just blessed by Nick. Uh, this week he's been helping me. We were, he was going to help me on a job yesterday and uh, went off the road and crashed his car. Um, and uh, he hit a tree. Beaver said he should have flipped the car over. But for some reason, the police officer said the car should have flipped. I don't understand why the car did not flip. That's what the police officer said to me. And uh, thankfully, um, Nick is okay. And uh, his car is totaled, but he is okay. And you know what that police officer said to me before he left the scene of the accident? He said, we can replace machines every day. Machinery can be replaced every day, but people can't. That's right. I'm so thankful for good police officers, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. So, Nick, you want to pray and bless this offering? Lord, we praise you for your faithfulness today. Yes, God. And Lord, even when things seem you know, they seem uncertain, God. Your certainty is more valuable. Oh, yes. And Lord, we praise you for who you are. We praise you that you are the great provider. You provide every need, Lord. Yeah. Even the quarter off the street or 
So maybe it's a property. Yes. Lord, we're praying that you'll provide all our needs. Yes, God. And we trust you. Yes, God. And we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It had all the makings of a bad situation. That's not very well lit out here. Late at night, in an industrial section of Venetia, California, <laughs> Officer Kirk Keffer says he spotted a shadowy figure in a dark hood. And he kind of caught me off guard because I normally don't see anybody out there. There's no sidewalks. He's kind of walking on the side of the street. You knew it wasn't right. Right, it wasn't right. Or was it? Jordan Duncan says he was minding his own business. And I noticed that it was a police car. I don't want him to think I had any weapons. Jordan explained to the officer that he was just walking home from work. There was no crime. The kid didn't need help. By all rights, Officer Kaffer could have, and many officers would have, just left him alone. But Kaffer isn't that kind of cop. He gave Jordan a ride. And more importantly, he gave him a listen. What struck you? Just his, uh, his drive, his work ethic. And to me, that, that speaks volumes. As Keffer took Jordan from where he works on the line here at Proform Laboratories, he started to really appreciate the young man sitting next to him. Because this wasn't just a trip around the block. This was a seven mile trek, a two and a half hour walk to Jordan's house, a whole town away in Vallejo, California. He said, in here walking? I said, yeah, walking. Not many 18 year olds that you meet have that kind of mindset. You know, there's. They don't even want to walk down to the store, let alone walk, you know, seven miles just to get to work. Jordan says he started walking to work after his car broke down last May. He says people have offered him rides, but he wants to make it on his own. And when Keffer heard that, he had heard enough. He immediately made plans to visit Jordan again. He said, hey, Jordan, you remember me, right? I was like, how could I not? How could I not? <laughs> so I said, Jordan, you're not in trouble. I said, we just want to give you something. To ease his commute, Kepper got the police association to buy Jordan a new bike. Mm -hmm. I was just looking at the bike like, this bike is going to be cherished. Mm -hmm. Kepper also raised an additional $38,000 to help him buy a car and pursue his career goal, which is to be a police officer. Oh. Jordan even got to ride along on a shift. I wanted to show him what law enforcement does. You're not going to shake this kid out. No. He's no, yours. He's mine. Yeah. <laughs> what started with a tense encounter, they end with a perfect partnership. Mm -hmm. Steve Harvin on the road in Benicia, California. I want to thank you for a good story. Yeah, we're going to release the kids. They're heading on down uh, across the parking lot to their building. Hey, take your Bibles with me. We're going to the book of Colossians this morning. We're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 1 and starting in verse 9. We'll read on down through verse 14. So, um, amen. I want to talk with you this morning about the title I've given the message I want to share with you is Kingdoms in Conflict. Kingdoms that are in conflict because we see that taking place right now. How many have heard something already today that you are blessed by? that you are encouraged by here. Anybody? Oh, good, good. I am so glad because that's what we're called to do is we're called to encourage and build up one another and fill one another with hope because that's what Paul was doing for a young man by the name of Ephesus is he was a young man that had went to the city of Colossae and he had, it's actually, that, that town was in what we now have as his Turkey, the country of Turkey. And he had went there, and they had planted this church. Paul has never, never been there, but he writes this book, Colossians, to give hope and encouragement to believers. Something that you've experienced already this morning is to be built up in your faith. And so Paul writes this letter, but this letter is not just to some people 2,000 years ago. This letter is an eternal word. That means it's spirit-led, it's spirit-inspired. Can you say none of that? 
Because that's what we need to understand is that the word of God is living and it's powerful and it's active. And so what God wants to do is not only encourage the believers at this, this church that's going through a struggle, but he wants to encourage you and I through this word. And I believe that that will be possible today because it's really a miraculous thing. Because when you hear God's word, it says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And so what happens is there's a miracle that happens is your faith is encouraged, your hope is built up, and you go out. That's why it says, do not forsake the assembly together. Do not forsake hearing the word. I can tell you that one of the most powerful things that I do during the week is I listen to people, I listen to the word being declared. I listen to messages because they encourage me, they inspire me, they fill me with a sense of purpose, a sense of knowing that in the midst of all the things that we're going, God is still speaking. And is he still speaking this morning? Is he still speaking today? Yes. Has he become silent? No. He hasn't. He is not silent in the days that we're living in right now. And I believe that this word is going to speak to you and I this morning. And so what he writes here is he writes because and, and just let me preface before I read. I'll read in a second. But he writes because over and over in the, in, in the epistles, there are false teachers that have come into the church. And really what it is, is it's about a, a religion. And so what Paul is doing is he's writing here and he's just reiterating to this young man, here's the foundation, it does not change. It's the foundations of the kingdom. And so in the spirit, in the face of religion, because that's what it all is, because it all came from religion, Paul writes to encourage these believers that you don't have to live in religion, but you're called to live in a kingdom. Let me say it again. You're not called to live in a religion or by a religion. You are called to live in a kingdom. And I tell you what, the more I'm seeing this and the more I'm understanding this, the greater the freedom is coming from myself. If no one else is getting anything out of this series, I'm getting a lot, okay? <laughs> so I'm really being encouraged and I'm being built up. So let's start in verse 9. And so from the day we heard, they've heard about this, his faithfulness and, and what the struggle is, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And he's transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. What a powerful promise this is. And he reiterates, as I said, he says, come into this kingdom. You're a part of a kingdom of the son that he loves. A kingdom of light. A kingdom of truth. So come out of these past forms. And we're going to put it up on the screen because this is exactly what in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. So do you have that for me, Mark? Thank you. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit or deception. According to the traditions, it's supposed to be, of men. What Paul is saying is that these things that are religious are forms. They're things that are built on traditions. And he says, no longer are you going to live in that realm, but I'm transferring you into a new realm, into a new kingdom. Because it says, it goes on to say, the basic principles of this world rather than Christ. Religion rather than a kingdom. We know the word liturgy. Right? And liturgy is defined as this. It's a form according to which public worship 
and it puts in parentheses, especially Christian worship is conducted. If it goes back to nothing more than tradition, if what you've experienced here today is nothing more than a form and walking through the traditions of the past, then you'll leave unchanged. You will leave uninspired. You will leave saying, oh, I fulfilled my duty, but that's it. What Paul is calling us to is to experience the God that he says to Timothy. It's not a form of godliness that lacks the power, but it is the very power of God to save and restore and renew and to set people free. See, that's the wonderful thing. When Jesus confronted people, he confronted most of all Pharisees. Who were Pharisees? They were teachers of religion. And why did he confront them? In Matthew chapter 15, he goes to this issue because a bunch of Pharisees come up to him and say, you know what, why is it? Why is it your disciples are breaking the tradition of our fathers? And they are not washing their hands before they eat. Oh, terrible. <laughs> terrible stuff. Here they're pointing out a small problem that they see. And you know what Jesus does? When you're confronted with somebody making accusations, why are you doing this? I sometimes think that we should respond maybe the way Jesus did. Instead of trying to debate or answer or defend ourselves, what did Jesus do? He said, why is it? He didn't answer their question. He answered their question with a question. He said, why? Now tell me, why is it? Why is it that you break the commandments of God? See, he was being asked, why do your disciples break the traditions of our fathers? He says, why are you breaking the traditions of my, or the commandments of my father? You get that? He goes right back to not traditions. He goes right back to the precepts and the plans of God. And, and, uh, and he says, the commandments of the Father, my, of God, are that you should honor your father and mother. But he says, you say to your father and mother, whatever way that I could have honored you, I'm doing toward God. And you have broken the commandments of God. And then he quotes from Isaiah, the prophet, and he says in verses 8 and 9, would you put that up for me, Mark? He says, you've broken these commandments. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Next verse. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. The kingdom is coming against religion. What Jesus started, because he says, I call you to a kingdom, not to a religion. I call you to step into a kingdom that is based on me being the king. You're not just following some traditions or doctrines of men. But you and I are stepping in. When, we've been, when you and I begin to understand this, this whole truth, what happens is it unlocks so many things before us. For my wife and I, I can tell you in the last, in the last, really the last year, but really in the last three years, we've stepped into a kingdom that says, God, we believe that you are the God of the impossible. We believe that nothing is too hard for you. We believe that where you call us, we're gonna follow. And you know what we've had? some resistance because it goes against their traditions of people. Here's what I hear over and over. Well, church doesn't act like that. Church don't do stuff like you do. If we allow the kingdom to be defined by the past traditions, we will never step into the wonderful things God has for us. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. We will never step out of traditions of saying, well, this is the way it's been done. This is the way it's always going to be done. Oh, wait, it's always going to be done. There's a revival coming, but here's the problem with many people that are praying for the revival is they want the revival to happen in the ways that it's happened in the past. And it's not going to happen like that. 
Because God is a God of the today. He's a God of the now. And he says, I'm doing a new thing. I'm going to know that new is not like the old. Correct. <laughs> He's doing a new thing. And so we have to be ready to say, God, I want to see the new thing you're doing. I don't want to just read about his miracles in the book. I want to see his miracles tomorrow. Amen. Don't you and I? Yes. Don't we want to be connected to a God that says, man, I'm with you today. In the midst of where you can be feeling such peace and such anxiety, or, or such anxiety, I'm going to give you a peace. Because I'm going to show you miracles. Where there's been signaling something that's went wrong in your life, I'm going to spin it. And it's going to be good. It's not only going to be good, it's going to be great. That's the God that we serve, isn't it? That is the God of heaven. And when he says, let your kingdom come as it is in the heaven, heaven is a place of miracles. Heaven is a place of authority. And that's what he wants to bring in our lives. Now that was all in the intro, okay? <laughs> so we're going to start in verse 9 now. So it says, we've not ceased to pray for you. Stepping into the kingdom is a kingdom where he says, I listen to you. Seek first. Remember, we talked about that. Pray. Pray always. When Paul talks to the Ephesians about going through a spiritual battle, and some of you are in the midst of a spiritual battle, he says at the end of that, he says, after you've taken up all the armor, the shield of faith, and the sword of the spirit, and the helmet of salvation, and all the spiritual armor that he talks about in chapter 6 of Ephesians, he says this, pray always. And with all kinds of prayer. Pray in the spirit. What does that mean? That no matter prayer, we've, 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 we've confined prayer to this. Well, I have to be in a secret, you know, I have to be in a quiet place and I have to be all in out and I have to be on my knees or whatever we define prayer as. That is not prayer. Prayer is continual, constant contact with the Heavenly Father. Can you say that? Amen. Amen. Continual, constant contact with the Heavenly Father. And when you and I begin to pray like that, we begin to see some incredible things. So he says, I want to, you to know that I am praying for you. We need to pray for one another. Helen walked into my office this morning and gave me a word. She said, I went home yesterday, last Sunday, and she said, I was so wore up. I just sit in my chair and fell asleep. And then she said, I was woken with a word that God asked for you, and I want to share that word with you. That you are going to be a mentor to pastors. I said, wow. And then she said, I just want you to know I pray for you every day. I pray for you every night. And Robin and Pastor Roy and Denise, I pray for you guys every night. And I said, I thank you. And I said, would you pray for me before I go back, before you leave? And she said, no one at pastor has ever asked me to pray for them. I want your prayers. I need your prayers. We need to pray one for another because we need to be strengthened and equipped with the power of God's spirit yes. because where we're walking is in uncharted territories. How many know that this has been a year of uncharted territories? <laughs> But we're believing for God to do some great things because he's up to something big. Filled with the knowledge, it's a spiritual wisdom, kingdom of heaven wisdom, filled with all the knowledge of his will. It's the opposite of earthly wisdom. Earthly wisdom does nothing more than puff up, as the scriptures tell us. But when we have godly wisdom, we have wisdom that's built in him. It says, wisdom from above is pure and peaceable. You might hear me pray this over and over. God, would you give us wisdom from above? Would you remove from me anything that's contaminated, anything that's conflicted? Because that's wisdom from this world. Wisdom from above is pure and peaceable. The opposite of pure and peaceable would be contaminated and conflicted. Am I right? So when we have wisdom from above, we know how we should respond and react in every situation. So it says in verse 10, then, so walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. Here's a great question at the end of the day. Did I walk in a manner that was pleasing to the Lord today? Did I walk in a manner that was pleasing to the Lord today? And if you will do that this week, here's what will happen to you immediately. The enemy will show you exactly, immediately, where all the places that you messed up with. 
And here's what he will try to do. He will try to shame you. And shame is based in your identity. And so immediately he will try to shame you and say, well, you did this wrong, you did this. That's shame. That is not from God. You might say, well, yeah, I said that wrong and I should have maybe acted a different way in that way. Hear me. The Lord doesn't see those things when you walk in a place of completeness and um, repentance toward him and say, God, I just want to connect with you today. And so hear me, do not let the enemy bring shame upon you at the end of the day when you say, did my life fully please you today, Lord? Because hear me, today the Lord is looking at the wonderful things that you did, the way you responded and reacted in the face of adversity or the face where you could have been angry or bitter. But he said, no, you put on love toward that person. You put on forgiveness toward that person. You put on compassion I know when you were feeling weak, you still pushed in and you still kept doing it. You didn't give up. You didn't just pull the blankets over your head and say, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going home and I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to tell you something. There are many days. Monday was one of them. That I felt just such a weight that I could have went back to my house and I could have just sat in my recliner and just so that's enough. But Monday was a day of great goodness, of great glory. Because I did not take that moment to say, man, in the midst of all of this, I'm going to retreat and I'm going to go just sit in a place and isolate myself. Hear me. When we know that God is with us, I want to fully please Him. And fully pleasing Him in this world is not isolation. And so I needed to keep doing what I was doing, even though everything in me said, man, get in the truck and point it toward the east and go sit on US 2, old US 2 in your house. Hear me. We want to fully please him, don't we? We want to please the one that's enlisted us into his service. It says bearing fruit in every good work, whatever you do, you can bear good fruit Increasing in the knowledge of God. And then in verse 11, it says, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. See, there's the strength of the kingdom coming. And what does the strength do for you? It gives you endurance. Doesn't it say that in verse 11? Endurance. Mark, would you put that up for me, verse 11? Stay with me. Verse 11. It gives you endurance. Steadfast, it says steadfastness. Another translation says endurance and patience joy, joyously. He will give you those things because that's the strength of God. That's what he wants to give to you and I. Do we need endurance right now? Yes. Do we need steadfastness and joy right now? Man, it is so desperately needed. It is so desperately needed. Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. You were running a good race. And then he asked this question. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? This kind of persuasion does not come from the one who called you. We need endurance. You were running a good race. He says to these Galatians, who had the audacity to cut in on you in your race? Sometimes we give the enemy rights that he doesn't have. No one should be able to cut in on us and keep us from running this race. Because it says this persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. The one who calls you says, man, I'm called you, I'm equipped you, now keep running. Keep running. Keep running. And what happens is it builds up endurance, doesn't it? It builds up the ability to keep moving. You're not living by your feelings. You're living by your faith, and you're going to continue to endure. And then it says, verse 12, giving thanks to God who's qualified you. I love that word. He's qualified you. You know, when they race at NASCAR, what happens is, or when they race, I saw one of my uh, guy I know, he was hauling his stock car yesterday, and I thought, man, he's going to a race. And what do they do at the beginning of the race? They qualify. And why do they qualify? Because if they don't get to a certain speed or if they don't make a lap in a certain amount of time, they don't qualify for the race. But here Paul's saying, you've been qualified for this race. It's not how good you are, it's how good he is. 
And so he's already qualified you for this race to share in the inheritance of the saints. Now, when we think of inheritance, we think it has to be when somebody died, right? Jesus died. He says, now is the kingdom. You can step into this inheritance that you have. So we don't have to wait until, say, well, that's just for, it's a now inheritance. You and I can receive the inheritance of God now. The inheritance of God now. My son-in-law, Robin told me last night, my son-in-law, I know we've been praying for him, and he's starting his own business. And I said, wow, how's that going for him? We were talking just last night late, and, and she said, well, his mom and dad are gonna give him part of his inheritance. And I was like, that struck me. They're gonna give part of his inheritance to him now. Think of that. Sometimes we think that we can't give an inheritance until somebody dies. How about we give part of their inheritance now? I thought for a mom and dad that's watching their son and they say, man, we see such potential in you. Yes, we believe in you. You can do this and we want to jumpstart this and we want to give you something to do that so that you can go out there and just be everything God's called you to be. Can you imagine the joy of the father and mother? Isn't that good? I believe this, that that's the same very absolute nature of who our Father is in heaven. He doesn't say to you and I, you know what, I want, you know, what a promise, we're going to get in heaven one day, and heaven's going to be without pain, and there's going to be no more tears, and how many are with me on that? There's gonna be, how many are looking forward to heaven? Yeah, we are. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. But you know what? I don't believe you have to wait to heaven to receive part of your inheritance right now. I mean, that's a good word. If you didn't get that, that's a good word. We heard a prophecy last, last Sunday. Christine, if you didn't hear it, or maybe you heard it, but you missed some of it, you need to go back on our YouTube or back in our Facebook and re-listen to that. Because that prophecy was unlike any prophecy I've ever heard come from this church. That prophecy was God was going to pour out blessings financially on people's lives. I don't know if you heard that. I believe that part of the inheritance of the kingdom is now, where God provides what you need now. Yes. He doesn't want you just to eat through life and say, I just barely making it. I am just oh, surviving. I'm just struggling to make it through today. That is not the kingdom living. There are going to be days in the kingdom where you are going to go through. Because Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have some trouble. Mm -hmm. But be of good cheer. I've overcome this world. I believe that being more than a conqueror, I'm going to talk about that here in a couple weeks. Being more than a conqueror, being victorious. How does victory show up in the life of a believer? Direct attributes of the life of a believer where victory shows up. But I believe the inheritance is a now inheritance. Where we can begin, like Joel is receiving part of his inheritance right now. I believe the Father has such things planned for you and I. The scriptures say that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the mind of man what the things the Father has prepared for those who love him. Do you know that scripture? Yes. I believe that. But I also believe that there's evidence today that says today you can step into the kingdom. Today, you can step into the joy and the peace and the strength and the provision and the protection of the kingdom. Amen. Today, you can do that. Because he says he's possible. Last verse. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness. Another translation, the New Living Translation says, he has rescued us. From the domain of darkness. He has rescued us from death. Don't you like a rescue story? Don't you like where man, God just shows up and he rescues people? I remember I watched, one of the first things I watched on live TV was on January 13th, 1982. It was flight um, from, headed to Florida out of Washington. And it was snowing heavily that afternoon. 
And because of the snow and the ice buildup on the wings, a 737 couldn't get enough lift off and hit a bridge that is on 395 over the Potomac. And it hit that bridge. And what happened is there were 77 people on that plane. And only five of them survived. It went right through the ice. Some of you remember that. Some of you are old enough to remember that. And it went right through the ice. And then there was a fuselage. Part of the tail section of that plane was still on some of the ice. And it was in this chunks of ice. The temperature that day in the water was 33 degrees. And it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And those people, 3 o'clock Central Time, 4 Eastern. And those people were in that water. Some of them for over 30 minutes. And there was a guy that was driving home from being, he worked in the budget office in their printing department, and he was driving home that day, and he saw the commotion, and he pulled his car over on the side of the interstate, and he went with hundreds of others to the banks of the shore of the Potomac to watch what was taking place. The news footage is, is just heart-wrenching, because as you watch it, I remember this as a 17-year-old young man watching this on live TV. And everyone's standing there and feels so powerless to do anything because the fire department has brought in some boats that are inflatable boats, but they're useless because they can't get through the ice chunks to get to the open water. There's jet fuel in the water. There were so many obstacles. They called the park police, and the park police had a guy by the name of Don Hudson who had been a Vietnam, uh, he had flown helicopters in Vietnam. Him and another guy jumped into a helicopter that wasn't equipped to rescue people. He grabbed one of those life rings on his way out. The guy with him is tying up knots and, and tying up ropes together so that he can string something together. And there's one woman that they can't rescue, and her name's Priscilla Tornado. She's a young mom in her 30s, and they can't rescue her because she has been in the water way too long. And she can't hold on to that life ring, remember that? And they lift her out of the water partway, and then she'll plunge in. And they lift her up again, and then she'll plunge down. And so now, not only is she been, she's no longer holding on to the fuselage, but now she's out in open water. And Larry Sputnik, who's standing on the shore with the hundreds of other people that are standing there, says, I see the look in her eye. And I, she, I can't take that I'm going to go home that day. That. And so what he does is you can see on some of the video footage there that he starts pulling off his jacket. And what does he do? We all know. He goes running with abandon and he plunges into that 33 temperature water. And he swims, and you can see him, and he swims and he grabs hold of Priscilla and he begins to pull her because he says, I'm not gonna let her drop. I think what courage. And he brings her to shore saves her life. He says, I saw her flounder and I knew she needed to be rescued. What it causes me to think of when I read that scripture is it causes me to think of the one who saw me flounder. The one who looked into my eyes one day and saw the panic in my eyes thinking, is this all there is to life? And feeling like it's not worth living. And then he ran from the shore of heaven and he came to rescue us from the domain of darkness. See, that's what Jesus does for every one of us, don't he? Yes. He sees us when everyone else is looking around and saying, man, I don't think it, no, no, that's no good. It's not going to work out. It's useless. It's hopeless. That person is hopeless. Jesus is still looking at people and he's saying, oh, no, they're not hopeless. There will be some people this week that the world has given up on. And they can't hold on to the rescue, that lifeline any longer, but God's called you. He has called you and he's called me to be those that will leave shore of safety and comfortability and say, I'm gonna reach out because if I don't, who might will? Amen. To rescue people, it says the domain. You know what that word domain means? The absolute control of darkness. And what did you say? I've called because he's the light. Darkness has to make way for light 
Because dark light is superior in authority over darkness. The only way that Jesus Christ can deliver us from the domain of darkness is what did Jesus say? I am the light of the world. I have all authority and power. The domain, the authority, the control of darkness has to give in to the authority of light. When we bring light into situations because we walk in the kingdom and we're called to be kingdom filled with light, transfer. I love that last thing we're going to close. It says transfer, doesn't it? Doesn't it say that in your Bible? He's transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. And we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. He's transferred us. You and I have been transferred. Nick told me about somebody that went and transferred $1,000 into his account. They took something and they transferred it over to him. And now what? He has been given the ability and the privilege of being blessed in that thing. What does Jesus say here? He has transferred us over into the kingdom. So what does that mean to you and I? That we can live in a place of privilege. That we can live in a place where we can experience all of him. How many want that? Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet? I believe that the Lord has given us some real things. And, and I want to encourage you that if God's given you something, I said this on the radio this morning, that if God has given you something today, he has given you a nugget, he has given you a nugget, I want you to take and write that down. I believe too often times we allow the enemy to take these things that have been planted into us by God's word. That's why it's so good for me to see some of you taking notes. Because I think, you know what? God's speaking something to them. And not some arrogance. I'm not, not in any of that. But I believe this, that God's speaking something to you. And you're saying, you know what? I want to remind, I want to be reminded of that. I want to remember that scripture. I want to remember the way God's speaking to me through that. So I'm just going to pray and we're going to close. Why don't you bow your heads? Hmm. How many God has spoken to you something today and you say, I just want that to be sealed in my heart and my mind. I'm stepping out of this kingdom of darkness in that area. I'm stepping into the kingdom of the one of his son. I, I'm going to ask God to take this word and it, I just ignite it into my heart, my mind, so I can walk with spiritual wisdom into this week ahead. How many need that? Just raise your hand and we're going to pray. Amen. Father, thank you that your word is so faithful that it will not return in void. Thank you for those that are streaming with us right now. Thank you that, God, you're speaking to people. If you're, you're streaming with us, hit, hit the like button. Just let me know that you're you're right there. And you say, that's me, Pastor. I, I need that today. I need that today. Father, thank you that, God, you are doing that right now because you're faithful to your word. You set your word. You set your word to accomplish your will. And so we say to the kingdom of darkness, the domain of darkness, back up. If you need to surrender to Christ this morning, just say, forgive me, fill me. If you need freedom today from addiction, say, set me free. I step into a kingdom of freedom out of a kingdom of bondage. So we say yes right now. We say overflow. Overflow into families, into structures that have been systemic problems. We say come out right now and let them be walking in the light the glory, the truth of Jesus. So we bless you and we praise you because you're the one that's begun a good work in us and you're the one that's going to complete it. And we are not going to let anyone cut in on us because we know that we have a hope in you, Jesus. Yes. And so we trust you today. And so we say in this area, in this region, in this nation, we say submit to the kingdom of the Son of his beloved. So we say, let chaos and confusion stop in the name of Jesus. Because that is not from the kingdom of heaven. That's from the kingdom of darkness. And so we say, light, light, flood, flood, flood. We bless you and praise you. How many believe in victory? Amen. Well, that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to celebrate some victories, all right? Can we celebrate some victories? God is for you, who can be? And there's nobody. Nobody qualifies for that. So let's worship before we leave, all right?
Let's do that. Let's walk by faith this week, not our feelings. Let's just keep saying, God, we are known. Amen. Glorious day. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met you.